I thought we had a great presentation this morning. Harold did a good job. Just a nice balance of you know, enough uh, information about the, the numbers and uh, focus on what we're doing. Prayers uh, for the things that we'll be doing in the future. And uh, Bobby, uh, leading all those, uh, reading all those, um, uh, those blue cards, people needing prayer for a variety of, of ailments. And uh, so I appreciate that part. I appreciate the blue card uh, part of the, uh, of the service. And I also appreciate it when uh, someone will hand in a card from time to time, simply asking uh, that we pray for our leaders, our elders, uh, deacons, the ministers. Uh, I personally, as one of the ministers, I'm always appreciative of uh, someone thinking that perhaps we also uh, need to be prayed for to do our work. And of course, I'm aware of the fact that the prayers that are offered not only uh, in public here, but prayers that are offered in private for those who serve uh, in a leadership role in the church. Many people have said to me personally, you know, I'm praying for you or our family prays for you and, and Marty and Mike and the others who serve. So my lesson tonight is to explain why these prayers are appropriate and very necessary. Uh, leaders carry a heavy burden of responsibility. And with this lesson, I, I'd like to make you aware so that you can be motivated in your prayers, especially for those leaders who hold the position of elders. And I'd like to describe some of the burdens that each of our leaders who serve as shepherds here have to carry. For example, there's the burden of character. Leaders become leaders for two reasons. One, they have the desire to serve in this way. You know, Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it is a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the work of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. I believe that Paul is explaining that the desire to lead is part of the calling that a man has to leadership in the assembly. I believe sincerely that God draws a man to this role and puts a desire into his heart to lead God's people. It's not healthy for a man to take on leadership, especially in the church, if he doesn't have the desire to do good works on behalf of the Lord as a leader of God's people. Another reason men aspire to lead is because they feel qualified to lead. They feel that they have some resources that they can offer in the service to the church. Paul the Apostle reviews these qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but in these qualifications, very interesting, we note that some of them are conditional. For example, a man must be married, that's a condition, and he must have children that believe, that also is a condition. Well, these qualifications, you know, they're easily determined simply through observation. We can tell, well, Marty, yeah, he's married, there's his wife, these are his children, and so on and so forth. There are, however, other qualifications which are more subjective in nature. Paul says again in 1 Timothy 3 that an overseer must be temperate and prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, or pugnacious, gentle, and so on and so forth. These things that I've just mentioned are qualities in a man that are not always easily detectable simply by looking, because they're parts of his character. These are things that he needs to develop over time. The burden here is that he must maintain the conditional qualifications, in other words, remain married, continue to have a good home, to rule his children well, and all those things, and he must maintain these conditional qualifications and at the same time needs to develop the skills such as teaching and hospitality and continue to grow in the character of Christ. This is a burden. This is a, a personal burden that he carries in order to simply continue in the role of leader. Of course, all are weak and sinners in the eyes of God. However, to retain effectiveness and credibility, God's leaders have to demonstrate 
that they can maintain their qualifications and they can improve their ability to teach and they can grow in Christian character even after they've reached a certain mature age. They never stop wanting to grow in the likeness of Christ. I believe this is a great burden of responsibility and it requires not only the effort of the individual but the prayers and the encouragement of the entire congregation. That's my point. Why should we continue to pray? We need to continue to pray for our leaders because they carry this burden of personal responsibility. And the thing is, if you're not in that role, nobody's watching you. But if you happen to be one of the elders, everybody's watching you. You're working out your salvation. You're working on your character. You're developing your qualifications in front of everybody. Unlike the rest who do not have that particular role, we're still responsible for that, but nobody's sitting there judging how well we're doing, other than ourselves, perhaps. Another great burden that leaders carry, and that is the burden of ministry. According to the scriptures, elders have a very specific ministry to carry out. First, they must first guard the doctrine. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 30, I want to read a brief but familiar passage. It says, Paul here is talking, uh, speaking to the elders that have, uh, that have uh, uh, come to see him. And he's speaking to these elders from Ephesus and he says to them, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit, notice, has made you overseers. Yes, the church puts in names and yes, of course, we, we discuss these things and we, we, we print out qualifications and, 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 and we give them to everybody to examine this you know, when we're, we're searching for new elders. But notice the Bible says here, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. It didn't say the congregation made you that. It's an office received from God. And he says, made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And so first of all, they must guard the doctrine. Elders are responsible for making sure that what is taught at every level in the church is accurate according to the Bible. This is one of their primary responsibilities as leaders in the church. They must protect the purity of the doctrine. Not, we, we don't have to protect the Bible. The Bible doesn't need us to protect it, but we have to protect the congregation from false teaching. Uh, even if it isn't maliciously done, sometimes people make mistakes in their classes. They're responsible to make sure that that doesn't happen. One of their primary responsibilities as leaders in the church. Another responsibility in the burden of ministry, they need to encourage and appoint evangelists. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 14, again Paul says, do not again is speaking to young Timothy, the, uh, the young evangelist, he says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery, by the elders. It's interesting to note in the Bible that when there are no elders, it is the responsibility of the evangelist to recruit and train and to raise up elders. Titus chapter one, verse five. And that cycle is complete when elders are in place. Well, when that happens, it is their responsibility to recruit and encourage and provide training for young evangelists as they did for Timothy. It is their responsibility to make sure that uh, preachers are sustained and supported in their work and have the encouragement that they need to continue faithfully serving in this Difficult role, what a, see the cycle, how wise God is. The evangelists go in, they establish the church, they plant the church through their preaching, they raise up elders for that particular congregation. Then with time, those elders seek out those that have the gift for preaching and teaching. And what do they do? They encourage that person 
into the ministry and at some point uh, ordain, we use the word ordain, but we commend that young evangelist into the service of the gospel to make that cycle complete. Another part in the burden of ministry that they have, the elders must guard the flock. You know, Paul encourages leaders to protect the church from false teachers. We said that in Acts 20, 28, but also to protect the church from division. Romans 16, verse 17. To protect the church from immoral conduct and the growth of improper moral influences in the congregation. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 9. You know, elders, they put out a lot of fires in this area and this is a great task that they must continually be attentive to. You know, they go to the meetings and all of a sudden someone says, okay, I, I need to report this is happening over here. Or sister so-and-so was over here, or brother so-and-so you know, was arrested and whatever happens. They're continually putting out fires, continually trying to make sure that a, perhaps a small dispute between two of the teachers, for example, doesn't blossom into a, an all-out war. Very delicate work, time-consuming. Another part of the burden of ministry, leaders in the church must minister to the weak and those who are sick. You know, it's interesting to note that in James chapter 5, verse 14, James tells people who are ill and suffering in the church that they should call on the elders to pray for them, not the deacons, not the evangelists. Now this doesn't mean, of course, that the preacher or the deacon or any member cannot pray or minister to anyone who is sick. Of course not. But what James is saying is that the elders have the primary responsibility for ministering through prayer, through their presence of comfort, those who are sick and those who are weak in the church. I can tell you after 38 years of ministry, having visited a lot of people in the hospital, it's one thing if I go, <laughs> but it isn't complete unless the elder goes in the mind of the individual who is ill. And I think, uh, you know, I'm looking at Bud here and he's, he's shaking his head. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they expect the preacher to go. Well, sure, he, he gets paid to do that. He gets paid. What else has he got to do? He's got nothing to do. Yeah, right. But the visit from the elder to hold his hand or her hand and to whisper a prayer to them and to say to them, be encouraged or don't be afraid and that we're with you. There's something deeply comforting for that individual because I think every person in the church knows that particular passage and they await expectantly the visit or the call from the elder. That is a burden. This is a great task and it's a time consuming task. And for this reason, we need to support our leaders and encourage them for the effort that they make. Another responsibility in the burden of ministry, leaders in the church must also be the ones to resolve disputes. In Acts chapter 15, we see that the apostles and the elders in the Jerusalem congregation gathered together to resolve an important doctrinal dispute that had taken place in Antioch. Note that it was the leaders in the congregation that had to listen to both sides of an argument and then make a decision as to the course that needed to be followed. And I'm always struck with the idea in Acts 15 that you know, the apostles were there and yet it says the apostles and the elders together. Nobody was pulling rank here. The Bible recognizes the authority and the leadership role of elders. Sometimes you know, we need a judgment call on a matter and we must allow our elders to make that call if we can't come to some resolution on our own. And this requires wisdom and patience. And for this reason we need to pray for our leaders so they will have the kind of wisdom and patience to make difficult decisions on matters where there is a dispute 
in the congregation because a wrong call sometimes can cause a lot of trouble. These tasks that I have described are the God-given tasks that elders need to carry out to guard the doctrine of the word, to encourage the evangelists, to guard the flock, to minister to the weak and the sick, to resolve disputes. When they are appointed to their position as elders, this is the work that they take on. This is the work that they agree to do. Here in Choctaw, I think we are well organized. However, it does take a lot of effort to oversee the teachers and the teaching program for so many classes. I think Brother Harold mentioned 80 people, 80 people involved in teaching. And to work with and encourage the ministers, we have three full-time ministers and the deacons as well, of course, with all of their separate tasks to visit and pray with the sick, to encourage young families, to care for the aged, the shut-ins. I hope you recognize that doing all of this requires hours of work away from home, visiting, on the phone, sending cards, having meetings. And four of our elders are retired, but three of our men still have full-time jobs. So we need to pray and cooperate with them because it takes time and effort and sacrifice to be a true shepherd. In the future, those who desire to become elders should understand the burden of ministry that comes with this role. Don't take on the role if you're not ready to take on the burden of ministry. And don't criticize one of our elders if he happens to retire because of the burden that he's carried for so long and needs to rest. We all benefit from elders who carry out their ministry, so we should all share in the prayers and the support and the encouragement of our elders and their families because they carry the burden of character as well as the burden of ministry. Another burden that elders carry is the burden of responsibility. You know, Harry Truman, former president of the United States, had that famous sign on his desk there that said, the buck stops here. Of course, he didn't mean the buck like the, the dollar. He meant the blame, the responsibility, as in passing the buck for you younger people here who are not familiar with this saying. Of course, in politics, the good thing about having the final responsibility is that you also get to make the rules. In business, you know, the boss is responsible, so the boss sets the rules. The boss is the one who hires, the boss is the one who fires, he cracks the whip, he or she cracks the whip if necessary. But in the church, we already have the rules, they're here. We don't make up our own rules. And we already have a boss, so to speak. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs> what God gives us in elders are people who are responsible for teaching us these rules and making sure that these rules or these teachings are done properly. He's given us men uh, uh, to protect us against those who would hurt us spiritually. He's given us these men to guarantee that the gospel will continue to be preached even after they are gone and they are here by God's charge for loving and caring for us even when we are weak or sick or troubled or dying. For loving and caring for us even when we don't love ourselves, even when we have become unlovable, God has put the charge to them to love us nevertheless. This is the burden of responsibility of the elders the things that God will hold them accountable for. I don't know about you, but this is a pretty tall order, isn't it? I mean, who can do this? I think most elders don't quite see all of this when they sign up to do the work. Yeah, become an elder, yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good idea. 
Yeah, I believe, you know, be with the men, you know, uh, I'll be able to, you know, give some direction. Yeah, sounds pretty good. <laughs> Till the first meeting. <laughs> but if they persevere and allow God to humble them and remake them, they will find that He can equip them through the grace of His love and the wisdom of His word to rise to the level of maturity in Christ not attained by many of us. Because along with the responsibility comes an opportunity. An opportunity in Christ that not many receive in life. You see, that's the secret. The burden of responsibility is great, but the potential in Christ is so exquisite. So you may be asking yourself, why is he preaching this lesson? It seems so narrow, so focused on so few. After all, we only have seven you know, brothers who are elders, you think, you know, and they're all staring at me. <laughs> and here I thought there'd be a big crowd, you know, and you could get lost in the crowd, but no. The reason that I'm teaching this particular lesson for these particular people are the following. First, well, it's part of my ministry as a preacher. Paul tells the young preacher, Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, 2 Timothy 4.2. And so the preacher is supposed to provide this, not just for the members, but for everyone including the leadership. In Titus, when Paul tells Titus to raise up elders, he doesn't just mean to appoint them on a given day, he means to find them and motivate them and train them and encourage them and also to raise their sights higher. You know, the elders encourage and they teach, they lead, they comfort us, but here's my question, who encourages them? Who rebukes them? Who teaches them? Who admonishes them? Well, the Bible tells us that, well, that's the evangelist's role to do this. This is God's perfect and balanced plan. I want, personally, I want our elders to see and to strive for the highest vision of their role possible. Secondly, I preach this lesson to inspire others, and that's the real reason that I am saddened that the the such bad weather that we had tonight, we have such a smaller crowd. How will a man desire if he doesn't see? You know, we are going to need more elders who wish to aspire to the high calling of eldership. I want to plant the seed in hearts. I want to strike the fire in someone's soul so that you will give more of yourself than you've ever dreamed that you could. And so this lesson is also a call to ask God to raise up more men who will take on the important task of being God's shepherds. I also preach this lesson for the wives of our elders. No leader can lead without a helpmate who loves the Lord as much as he does. I want to give to each elder's wife, each future elder's wife, the notion that her husband's calling and vocation is an enterprise worthy of her full devotion. I want her to know that as the spouse, she shares in the success or the failure, in the reward as well as the rebuke. I call out to the elder's wives to make this a priority in your lives knowing that if you don't, he won't either. And I preach this lesson for the congregation. I want you to know the value and the context of the height and the depth of the sacrifice that ordinary people are making for you and for me. You know, elders and their families are like your family, except for one main difference. When you go to bed, you think about your life and your family. But when elders go to bed, 
they think and pray not only for their own family, but they carry the burden of your family with them into their sleep. Perhaps you have had a tragedy or a crisis in your life. And one of your first calls was to the office or to Marty, uh, because of course he serves in the dual capacity as uh, the uh, pulpit minister, but as also as an elder, or your first call goes to Johnny, or one of our elders, and, oh, my son's had a terrible accident, and, all right, I'll meet you at the hospital, and, you know, and your crisis, and he's there in your crisis, until hopefully it passes and there's some, you know, some sort of resolution But the reality of the situation is that, well, that was your crisis, your one crisis in your own life. But that may have been his fifth crisis this week. So you, you, you and I, we only have our own crisis, but they must participate in everybody's crisis. Who are they that they should have to do this thing? They don't get paid for it. There's no great honor. I mean, you know, they don't, they don't get a limo. There's no applause or anything like that. The reward is from the Lord in the future. Why do they have to do all of that? Remember that when you pray. Remember that when you see them. And let your words and actions support them in the burden of leadership. And of course, the greatest burden of all that the elders carry is for unsaved souls, especially those souls who are close by or even within these walls. So as I close out this lesson this evening, I encourage anyone who needs to unburden their souls of sin, certainly to come and confess Christ and be baptized, to remove that burden from your heart and from your soul. And I also want to remind you that we will need preachers and elders and deacons. Who are they in this congregation? Who's going to be the next elder and join the ones that we have in service? Who are the next deacons that will take on important ministry responsibility? Who are going to be the preachers? You know, Marty's getting so old. I mean, it's, you know, uh, so I got an amen. The only, amen, I didn't get anything for the sermon, but I got an amen on how old you look. <laughs> he can still hear it. No, but seriously, where, where's the young blood? I've been back seven, back, you know, seven years. I haven't seen, I hadn't heard one single person say, I want to go to preacher school, I want to do this, I want, I want to go and be a minister, will you help me? If anybody come to the elders, ask for money to be a preacher? At this rate, why, why should we have to put an ad, I mean we're 350 to 400 people, why should we ever have to put an ad in the paper to look for a preacher who has to come from, I don't know where, New Mexico or California or Texas? You mean we can't grow our own here? Where are those young men? Where are those mature men who are in the strength of their lives, you know, in, the, in the meaty part of their lives, they're at the top of their game, they're at the top of their game in their, in their careers, and, and where are those men who are going to come and step up to, to, to be deacons? And where are the ones who, who will say, here I am, Lord, use me, use me. I'll, I'm ready to sacrifice my life to shepherd your people. Pour my life out as a sacrifice of service. Where are those men? Well, we won't find them if we don't start praying. If we don't stop calling out to God, telling us, show us who they are, Lord. Better still, Lord, put a burden on the hearts of some of these individuals. 
Lord, put, put, put it in the heart of one of these young women or one of these mothers to, to encourage their husband to seek more fervently your will in taking on the responsibility of leadership in the church. I don't usually do this, this is not my way, but I would like to close up my sermon with a brief prayer uh, at this time. While reminding, uh, I look around and I kind of see everyone here, a member of the church. Nevertheless, if you've not been baptized, of course, come, come and become a Christian, or if you need the prayers of the church, absolutely. But for now, let's have a prayer together as we close out this lesson about leadership. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your church. We are so grateful that you have called us and brought us into the kingdom as we await your glorious return, Father, and the eternity that we will spend with you and our Lord Jesus in perfect harmony through your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we, we call out to you now to put into the hearts and minds of young men and, and older men, Father, the desire to serve you, the desire to put away the things of childhood and take on the things of manhood, to put away the things of this world and take on the things of the kingdom, Father. We pray, Lord, that you will raise up among us godly men and godly women who will lead this congregation into the future. And we also pray, Father, that you bless those who are now in the role of leadership. Our shepherds and their wives, we pray your blessing on them for the burdens that they carry, that you strengthen them and encourage them in these things. And for our deacons and their wives, that you help them, Father, in the many tasks that are before them and that they find joy in their service, Father. And we pray also for those who preach and teach in this congregation, that you would continue to hold them up and, and, and give them a clear mind and a clear understanding of your word and the courage to speak it at every time. And Father, we pray for the congregation that we will love one another and support one another and especially pray for one another and especially pray for those who lead us in Christ. Father, we know you hear our prayer. We pray that you will answer it soon. All these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen.